Here they come. Pay attention, the ceremony is short. These are the opening words of one of several sonnets by the famous poet Giuseppe Belli, inspired by executions that took place in Rome. Up to 1870, in times when the city was ruled by the Pope King, an absolute monarchy, public executions were one of the common people's favorite happenings, attended by crowds who found this unholy practice not only amusing, but even took their sons to witness the event to remind them of their fate if they ever crossed certain lines. From 1796 to 1864, only one man was in charge of the rather frequent executions in Rome. Giovanni Battista Bugatti, whose nickname Mastro Tita, became legendary and synonymous with executioner. He was the longest serving executioner in the history of the Papal States. During his 68-year career as the Pope's deliverer of sentences, he performed 516 executions, roughly one kill every 48.2 days until he was 85 years old. He served for so long that in his career he worked under six different popes. Little is known about his early life, but we do know that he was born in 1779 in Senegalia, a port town on the Adriatic coast about 30 kilometers northwest of the city of Ancona. The circumstances that led to him being granted such an important role in Roman life at the young age of 17 are unfortunately also unknown. He was married but had no children. Incredibly, when not carrying out his official duties, Bugatti and his wife sold painted umbrellas and other souvenirs to tourists who presumably had no idea of his true identity. He was naturally disliked by his fellow citizens, so much so that he was forbidden out of prudence to go to the center of the city on the other side of the Tiber River. This was because in Rome, the public executions decreed by the Pope, especially the exemplary ones, did not take place in the Papal village but on the other side of the Tiber, in the Piazza del Popolo or in the Piazza del Velabro. For this reason, Bugatti had to cross the famous bridge Saint Angelo to go and render his services. This fact gave rise to the famous Roman saying, when Mastro Tita crosses the bridge which signified that on that day the execution of a capital sentence was scheduled and crowds would start gathering to witness the proceeding. Bugatti himself called the executions justices and referred to the condemned as patients. He bore no personal animosity towards his victims and would often offer them a pinch of snuff as a last experience of earthly pleasure. He was skilled in what he did, whether it was an execution by hanging, beheading by axe, the administration of a fatal blow with a mallet, or with a guillotine. He prided himself on being both neat and quick. Most executions were related to the punishment of civil crimes committed within the papal states, with the condemned convicted within the civil courts. For example, in 1585, Pope Sixtus V initiated the first brutal zero-tolerance crackdown on crime which according to legend resulted in more severed heads collected on the San Angelo Bridge than melons in the Roman markets. Although the best records are from Giovanni Bugatti, who recorded the name of the condemned, the crime, and the location, as well as the method of execution, and their final words for each of his 516 justices. As written down in his journal, his first victim, on the 22nd of March 1796, was Nicola Gentilucci, who had been convicted of strangling and killing a priest, a coachman, and robbing two friars. He treated his responsibilities with the utmost solemnity, leaving his home early in the morning on the days of execution, dressed in his scarlet executioner's coat, stopping off first at the Church of Santa Maria for confession, then crossing the bridge to perform his duties. We have two surviving eyewitness accounts of executions from the Mastro. The first and shorter one from Charles Dickens. He explains how he headed to the location of the execution accompanied by his two friends, and they waited for hours before the execution took place. Mastro Tita used the guillotine for the execution, and he continues to describe how it happened. The prisoner knelt down and had his head secured into a hole. All of a sudden, the guillotine plank descended, and the prisoner's head fell into a bag. The Mastro Tita then held the decapitated head by the hair and showed it to the crowd. Dickens notes that it was an ugly, filthy, careless, and sickening spectacle. The second eyewitness account comes from George Gordon Byron, who was in the Piazza del Popolo while three condemned men are being beheaded. The poet described the experience as follows. 
The day before I left Rome, I saw three robbers guillotined. Two of these three men behaved calmly enough, but the first of the three died with great terror and reluctance, which was very horrible. He would not lie down, then his neck was too large for the aperture, and the priest was obliged to drown his exclamations with still louder exhortations. The head was off before the eye could trace the blow, but from an attempt to draw back the head, notwithstanding it was held forward by the hair, the first head was cut off close to the ears. The first execution turned me quite hot and thirsty, and made me shake so that I could hardly hold the opera glass. The second and third, I am ashamed to say, had no effect on me, though I would have saved them if I could. Remarkably, Bugatti is said to have maintained his strength and precision into his work even into the old age of 85 years old. It was only then that he agreed to retire, accepting a pension from Pope Pius IX. He returned to Senegalia and lived a further five years. Today, his blood-stained scarlet coat, plus a selection of axes and guillotines are on display in Rome's Museum of Criminology. The Mastro Tita's last entry in his journal ends with the chilling line. So ends the long list of Bugatti. May that of his successor be shorter. On that note, we will end today's video and hope to see you in the next one.